Our next speaker is Allison Gopnik, distinguished professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Partic She's a world leader in cognitive science, particularly in the study of children's learning and development. She's the author of several best-selling and critically acclaimed books, such as The Scientist in the Crib and The Philosophical Baby. She's with us today online from California, so let's call her Professor Gopnik. Welcome and thank uh, you for joining us. I'm sure it's quite a late time for you over there. Yeah, it's, it's the evening anyway, but I'm so glad to be here. I wish I was, I wish I was uh, in Japan in person, but uh, this is the sec next best thing. Thank you very much. It's over to you now. Okay, great. Uh, Again, thank you so much for inviting me and being part of this important forum. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about work and ideas um, that I and others have been working on connecting um, AI and child development, both very important aspects of what it means to be, uh, uh, the way that our being human is going to be uh, affected in the, in the near future. Um, let me start off by showing this, these slides. And this first slide is actually a quote from Alan Turing, who was really the person who invented computation, who invented computers. And in the very first paper that he wrote about artificial intelligence, uh, there's a, this very interesting line. He first starts out saying, maybe we should think about intelligence by trying to imitate a, a, an adult. But then he says, but you know, actually the real secret to intelligence would be if we had a system that could, uh, that could think the way that children do. And the reason why he says this is because the real thing that you would want an intelligent system to be able to do is to learn from its experience. And children are the best learners that we know of in the universe. So what we've been doing for the past 10 years and especially for the past five years is working with people in computer science to try and figure out how close are our current artificial intelligence systems to being able to learn like children? Um, and what could we do to make them more learn in a way that's more like children? And what are some of the morals for that enterprise, both for the way that we think about AI and also the way that we think about children? Um, so let me start out by saying there's a really interesting phenomenon that happens when you look at biology and think about evolution. And that is that the longer the period of childhood a species has, the more, the, lo the longer their children, um, the smarter they are. And the classic examples of this are if you compare this crow, this new Caledonian crow, and crows and corvids are, are very intelligent animals, um, that crow can do things that are very similar to what, say, chimpanzees can do, use tools and uh, be remarkably intelligent. Um, but those crows are fledglings. They need to be taken care of uh, for as long as two years, which is a long time in the life of a bird. And if you compare that with, say, the domestic chicken, chickens are very good at digging for grain, not very good at doing anything else, and they're mature by just a couple of weeks. And we see this not only for birds, but for mammals, for, as we'll see later, for marsupials. And humans are the most dramatic example of this. If you compare human childhood with the childhood of our closest primate relatives, like chimpanzees, this chimpanzee is uh, producing as much food as he's consuming by the time he's seven years old. And even in forager societies, human children aren't doing that until they're at least 15 years old. Sometimes we're still paying rent checks even when they're in their 30s or 40s. Um, and of course, humans have the largest brains and are the species that relies the most on learning and in some sense are the smartest species, species although that still sort of remains to be seen. Um, so the question is, why would we see this relationship between a very long childhood, the childhood that we just take for granted, and uh, an ability to be extremely intelligent and to have a large brain. And what I've been arguing is that you can understand why we have this very long childhood in terms of some ideas that actually come from AI, that come from computer science. So a very basic idea in AI is that there's what's called the exploitation versus exploration trade-off. What does that mean? 
That means that let's imagine that you're trying to solve some problem. You have some kind of problem you're trying to solve. And you could think about it as if there's a big box of solutions that you could have to that problem. And you're at one place in the box. And the question is, how do you move through the box to find possible new solutions? And one way you could do it is you could just make little changes to what you already know. You could just, just change small things and try to get to a solution that was good enough pretty quickly. But another thing that you could do <laughs> is you could bounce around the box. You could try things that are really different from anything that you've tried before. And then you could try something else that's even more different from the things that you tried before. And in AI, we talk about this as a, a measure of temperature. So a low temperature search means that uh, you're looking very close to where you already are, and a high temperature search means that you're bouncing around the space. If you use one of the large language models like ChatGPT, you can actually adjust the temperature, and the higher the temperature, the weirder and stranger the responses are going to be. Um, now, there's an intrinsic trade-off between these two kinds of search. So if you just do the low temperature search, you just make small changes to where you are now, um, there might be a much better solution that's more different from what you're currently doing. But if you're always trying things that are really, really different from what you're already doing, you're gonna spend a lot of time considering solutions that actually aren't gonna be very useful and aren't going to really work well. And the way that we solve this problem in, in AI is something called simulated annealing, which means you start out with this high temperature exploratory search. You start out trying all sorts of different kinds of things, and then you gradually narrow in to the more exploited search. And my hypothesis has been that childhood is really evolution's way of resolving these explore-exploit trade-offs um, and doing something like simulated annealing because you have this early period, childhood, where you can just explore, you can learn, you can try all sorts of different kinds of things. And then you have this later period, adulthood, when you narrow in just to the, on the solutions that are going to be the most useful and helpful. And I think this is an interesting way of thinking about childhood because many things that we might think of as bugs about ch children and that people have thought are proof that children are, are irrational or, or primitive are actually features from this explore perspective. So things like the fact that children are variable, they do things in a kind of random way, that they take risks, that they're impulsive, that they spend all their time playing instead of working, that they're insatiably curious, that they pay attention to everything at once instead of just focusing on the things that we think are important. All those things that might look like bugs are really features if you think about a creature that's just designed to explore and learn as much as possible. And actually, even if you look at brain development, you can see evidence for this shift from exploration and learning to exploitation. So in the early period, up to about age five, many, many new synapses, many new connections are being formed in the brain. And then what happens is there's a kind of tipping point where the connections that have already been formed become stronger and more efficient, but connections that haven't been strengthened just disappear. They're what's called pruned. So you have an early brain that's very, very flexible, very plastic, as neuroscientists say, but not very efficient. And then you have a later brain that's much more efficient, but not nearly as plastic, not as good at learning and changing. Uh, well, could we actually show that children are doing this kind of wide-ranging exploratory learning? And how does, it, how does it compare to what adults are doing and to what AI is doing? And for the last 20 years or so, we've been trying to see how children learn with these very simple kinds of methods. So we're looking at, you know, two-year-olds, um, and you can't really get them to fill out an exam or fill out a questionnaire. How could you find out how they're exploring and learning? And we do it with this little toy called the Blicker Detector and other ones like it. It's a little box that lights up and plays music when you put some things on it and not others. And the baby or the child's job is to figure out how this little toy works. And it might seem very simple, but there are actually lots of different ways that the toys could work and lots of different things that could be a look at. Uh, now, what I'm gonna talk about, so we've been using that idea to try to figure out and do these comparisons that, um, that Turing suggested between the way that children are learning and the way that AIs are learning. Uh, and you can read about this and this sort of general perspective in this paper that just came out in Perspectives in Psychological Science that you can, you can find online. Um, 
Now, the first point that we want to make about things like large language models, things like ChatGPT, is that often when people are comparing artificial intelligences to human intelligence, um, they do it by thinking about the AI as if it was a, an individual intelligent agent, as if it was an agent that was going out into the world and doing things. Um, and you might think of it as being a super intelligent agent, a kind of genius, or you might think of it as being a really evil, malign uh, agent like the golem. Um, or you might think of it as both. You might think of it as being super intelligent and evil. And there are definitely people who feel that way about AI. Um, we think that that's really the wrong way of thinking about what these systems, especially the large models like uh, ChatGPT, uh, are doing and what they can do. And instead of thinking of them as individual agents, I think the right way to think of them is, is what I called cultural technologies. What's a cultural technology? A cultural technology is a technology that lets individual people learn from other people. Um, so one of the things that's most distinctive about human beings in particular is that we have culture. We learn from what other people have discovered in the past, or we can learn from what people far away from us have discovered. It's one of our, arguably, one of our greatest strengths. Um, and you could argue that even language itself, which is so distinctively human, is this kind of cultural technology that lets us get information from far away and long ago. Um, but as we've developed, we've developed more and more of these technologies, and each te new technology lets us get more information more effectively and efficiently. So we developed writing, which lets us get information not just from the people that we can see who are right in front of us, but from people who are very far away in time or in space. Um, and that's even more true if you think about things like print. We also develop things like libraries and indexes so that we could search through all that writed, writing and printed material. And of course, most recently, we've developed the internet, which puts all that information very close to us. And we had to develop things like internet search or Wikipedia to deal with that information. And what we argue in this paper is that these large foundation models are really just the latest step in that development. They don't know anything themselves. They're not intelligent themselves. But what they do do is provide information from all those hundreds of thousands of people who have posted things on the web, who've written, um, um, put, uh, produced text or produced images. And really what the models are doing is just summarizing that very, that vast amount of information so people can access it. Now that's not trivial, that's really important. Things like writing and print and libraries and the internet have really do and have changed society. And with each one of these new technologies, we have to work out new kinds of regulations, new ways of thinking about them, new ways of new institutions like um, editors and libel laws that enable us to, uh, to master the good of these new technologies and avoid the bad. And I think that's certainly gonna be true about large models. But that's not at all the same thing as thinking that we have these individual intelligent agents that are going to come to life and take over and, uh, and, and do uh, and, and be an existential uh, threat. All right, why don't I think that they're like intelligent agents? Well, what we've been doing is trying to compare some of these large models in particular with uh, human children. And to go back to what I was saying, this is work with uh, Eliza Kosoy, my, my graduate student. Um, to go back to what I was saying before, the big question we would like to ask is, can these, so these systems are very good at transmission. They're very good at allowing us to get information, but can they actually go out and explore in the world and find new things? Can they innovate as well as imitating? And I won't go into all the details they are in the paper, but let me just give you an example of the kind of experiments that we're doing to try and test this. So what we did was take our blick detector that, as I said, we've used to look at children's learning, and we made an online version. And perhaps the most interesting thing about these studies is that 20 years ago, children wouldn't interact with a screen in the way that they would interact with a real machine. Um, but now they're quite happy because they have touch interfaces. They're quite happy to treat the box on the screen as if it was a real object that they could explore and find out about. Um, so what we did was make this virtual blick detector and things go on the detector. And sometimes the detector lights up and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and what we really want to know is not just, we want to know which ones make it go, which ones are blickets. That's a made up 
made up English word. Um, but we also want to know how does the machine work in general? And we've set this up so that the machine can either work on a kind of obvious principle. If you put a blicket on, it goes. If you don't, if it's not a blicket, it won't go. Or it could work in a more subtle and unusual way. You could have a principle that says you have to have more than one blicket to make it go. There isn't enough blicketness in just one. You need a combination. And in work that we've done before, we've discovered that children are remarkably good at learning about how a causal system like this works, even three and four year old children. Um, and in fact, when the way it works is unusual or strange, they're better at learning about it than grown ups are. So, to go back to that idea about exploitation versus exploration, the grown ups have pretty strong ideas about how this should work, and they just stick to the ideas that they already have. And the children seem to be much more willing to explore, try something new, try something that's strange and odd and, and out of the box, as, as we say. So we've done a lot of experiments like that and other experiments that show that even though grown-ups are better than children at doing most things, if you have a task that demands really being imaginative, you have a task that means that you have to think differently, then children are actually better than adults. And that fits this picture of children being the sort of explorers as I've sometimes said, the research and development division of the human species. Um, so here's actually a child who's playing with, uh, uh, playing with a detector. And as you can see, this is of course done in over, part of the reason we did it online was because this was during COVID. But even then the children are very eager and interested in the machine and trying very hard to figure it out. Um, uh, and in this, part of what made this experiment interesting to us was in the previous experiments we actually given the children the data, the evidence, and then we saw what they concluded about the box, about the book detector. But in this experiment, we wanted to see what well, just doing what children do, just playing, just messing about, would they get the right kind of information that they needed and could they solve and figure out how this machine worked? And what we discovered was that in just 20 tries or so, a few minutes of playing, um, the children first of all, got the right kind of evidence about how the system worked, and they solved the problem. They figured out how the machine worked. Um, and again, if you have ever seen a four-year-old, um, four-year-olds are doing these kinds of experiments all the time, but when they do it, we say that they're getting into everything. Um, uh, and what our experiments show is that what they're really doing is just like just like good scientists, my, my uh, first book was called The Scientist in the Crib, they're doing experiments to figure out how this works. Well, how does this compare to um, how does this compare to AIs? So we did you looked at two different kinds of AI systems. One of them is what's called a reinforcement learning agent. These are very powerful learning systems. They're the ones that enabled um, Google DeepMind to uh, to win at Go. Um, and what we discovered was that. Although they could do it, it took hundreds of thousands of trials for the reinforcement learning, the AIs, to solve the problem, whereas the children were doing it in about 20 trials. Um, and what's more, the children did it in a way that let them generalize. Even though they'd only seen a little bit of information, they could uh, apply that to a brand new machine, for example. And the agents, the artificial agents, in those hundreds of thousands of trials, had learned a bunch of specific things about how this machine worked, but they weren't very good at generalizing. And then what we did was we went to the large language models, the GPT kind of models, and we simply put as text, um, uh, we, oh, sorry, this is the children's data. Oh, oh dear, I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide here. Um, so this is the slide that shows that how, how good the children were at solving this problem. Um, then what we did was we gave the, did the same thing with large language models. We typed in the same things that the children had seen. So we typed in, all right, you're trying to figure out how this blicket detector works. You just saw that a red one and a blue one on the detector make it go, but a blue one on the detector doesn't make it go. Now tell me which one is a blicket. So we did all this with text and we gave them exactly the same information that the children had had. Um, and the short answer is that the systems were very bad at it. Um, GPT-4, which is the most recent one, was better than the other uh, systems were, but they were still not very good at all at trying to solve this kind of task. And that's very consistent with other work in our lab and in other labs that suggest that 
even though these systems are very good at generating convincing text and pictures, they're very bad at actually going out into the world, exploring, getting new information about what the world is like, and changing their minds about um, how the world worked. So, uh, so we think that's the big difference between this kind of transmission intelligence, this ability to pass on information, and the ability to actually go out and create and find out about information yourself, which is the thing that the children are so good at doing. Okay, so what I've suggested is that those little two-year-olds that we kind of don't pay much attention to except to tell them to stop getting into everything are one really, really important piece. Their exploration and play is a crucial piece in human intelligence and one that, at least so far, the artificial intelligence systems don't have. Um, now I want to talk about another crucial piece of that, uh, another crucial piece of that, uh, that human system. And to set this up, I'm going to give you another example of the way that very young children explore. This is actually from a study that uh, Nim Tottenham did. Now, the oldest finding in all of psychology about learning, going back to John Watson, is this. You take a rat, you put it in a maze, it goes down one arm of the maze and it nothing happens. It goes down the other arm of the maze and it has a shock. It will never go down the arm of the maze that has the shock um, again. That seems very basic, very important kind of learning. But there's a catch to that kind of learning. And that is, suppose it's changed. Suppose now that arm that once had a shelf really has cheese on it. If you never go down that arm of the maze, you're never going to find out that things have changed, that things are new, that there's new things that you could do that would make you uh, thrive better in, uh, would make you thrive better in the world. Uh, and what, uh, uh, some psycho comparative psychologists discovered was that although it's true that the adult um, uh, the adult rats will avoid that arm of the maze forever. And by the way, when you look at certain kinds of psychopathologies like anxiety, part of what happens in anxiety disorders is that we learn that something bad happens once and then we never learn to change our minds about it because we keep avoiding that uh, potentially scary situation. Um, what they discovered was that this was not true if you looked at young rats um, and young mice. So if you looked at a juvenile, uh, actually sort of interestingly about the equivalent of a teenager, they actually preferred to go on the arm that had the negative outcome. And Nim showed that this was also true for three and four-year-old children. But both the rats and the children will only do this if there is a parent present. Um, so only if the mother is present or another caregiver is present, that gives the children the confidence to think that they can actually go out and try and explore something, even if it might be scary or even if it might have negative consequences. So those mothers, those caregivers, are, are the other really central piece of the picture. The children can only explore because they have caregivers who are there looking after them and making sure that, uh, that nothing uh, dangerous or bad uh, nothing too dangerous or bad happens to them. And I've been thinking a lot about this caregiving and parental investment. This is a, 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 a paper uh, that's, uh, that's in Daedalus thinking about this. Um, and in fact, if you go back to thinking about human evolution, you see, just like you see a relationship between how smart the animals are, how large their brains are, and how long a childhood they have, you also see a relationship between this intelligence and how much parental investment there is. So if you compare these marsupials, for instance, the possum, the biological mother, is the only one who's taking care of the babies, and she has many babies at a time, and they mature very quickly. You compare this with this other um, animal, the adorable quokka. Um, the father and the mother are both involved in taking care of the babies. They only have one baby at a time, and the baby spends as long as a year in the mother's pouch. And the quokka's brains are twice as big as the possum's brains. So it seems as if this parental investment is another really important piece in human intelligence. Um, uh, and in fact, again, if you compare us to our closest primate relatives, uh, for chimpanzees, like for the possums, the biological mothers are the ones who are taking care of the babies. But for humans, we have what I think of as the investment triple threat. So we have fathers who are what we call pair bonded, who are close to mothers and children and love their mothers and love mothers and children and take care of them. 
Um, we have what the great anthropologist Sarah Hurdy calls alloparents. So we have people who are not actually the kin of uh, biological kin to children, who nevertheless are very involved and engaged in taking care of them. And we have my personal favorite, um, postmenopausal grandmothers. So we have women who are not fertile themselves anymore. That's very unusual among, uh, among animals, but who are nevertheless providing resources that help these young children to thrive. And not only are they providing resources in the sense that they're going out and getting food, and there's beautiful studies that show that the survival of children in forager cult, uh, communities really depends on the fact that the grandmothers are feeding them as well as uh, the mothers and fathers. But this grandmother in this picture, you can see lurking behind these three beautiful grandchildren, is doing something else. She's passing on information. So remember I said there was this kind of cultural niche that's so characteristically human, and the grandmothers and grandfathers seem to play a really important role in passing on the wisdom and knowledge of the past to a new generation. So it's this combination of these exploratory, playful children and the caring um, uh, caregivers, especially I think the elders and the grandmothers, the caring, teaching grandmothers. It's that combination that actually allows us to make as much human progress as we do. And I think that's important because that caring has a very different kind of structure than most of the kinds of things we think of as social relationships. So most of our understanding of politics and economics and sociology depends on the idea of a social contract. So there's things that I want and there's things that you want and we're, we're balancing what I want and what you want. But if you think about the kind of care that we give to children, the kind of care that every grant mother or grandfather gives, there isn't really this sense of reciprocity. You're just doing things to try to help the future. You're doing things to try and help your children or your grandchildren to develop their own goals, develop their ideas, be able to explore, be able to find out things that you yourself haven't found out in your, uh, in your own generation. And I think one of the things that's a tremendous challenge, especially as we see the demographic changes that have been happening, in fact, in Japan first, but are happening throughout, uh, uh, throughout the world, uh, where we have fewer children and more elders, is that this dimension of care is very important, and it doesn't show up in things like the gross domestic product, the way that we care for our elders, the way that we care for our children, the way that our elders care for our children. All that's so important, so crucial to human intelligence and advancement, and, and yet no one pays very much attention to it. People treat it as if it's just this little private thing, not something that the society at large really has to, um, has to support in a profound way. And in fact, I think this is even true, uh, sorry, and we know from lots of, uh, of data that the lack of this kind of nurturance and caregiving early on in, in, in uh, development, what, what people call adverse childhood experiences or these ACEs, um, are remarkably uh, predictable, uh, are remarkably um, uh, consistent predictors of things like poverty, uh, like depression, anxiety, and even things like cancer and heart disease and mortality. So not having that early period of protected caregiving seems to lead to all these outcomes, negative outcomes. But a very interesting recent set of findings is that the way that those bad early experiences or that lack of early nurture lead to adverse uh, outcomes is by making children grow up too quickly. So it looks as if what happens is that these kind of adverse experiences actually lead to faster maturation. Um, children with adverse experiences reach puberty more quickly. They even get their adult teeth sooner. And there's very good evidence that their brains develop too quickly. Um, so if you go back to that idea of the explore-exploit trade-off, it's like what happens when you get early signals that life is difficult, that you're not going to have this nurturance, you don't have the luxury of exploring, thinking about new possibilities, finding out different ways that the world could be. What happens is that you too quickly move into this mode of, let me just figure out what it is that I, uh, I want to do now. Um, what, I, what do I need to do to succeed now? Um, and you can even see this problem if you're thinking about um, artificial intelligences. 
Uh, this is a, a cover of a beautiful novella by the science fiction writer, uh, Ted Chang, um, where he imagines what it would be like to actually raise artificial intelligences. And if we are going to have anything that looks like it's genuinely intelligent, we're going to have to face the same dilemmas that we face all the time with our own children. How do we give them the kind of room to have goals and uh, intentions um, that are good, that are beneficent, that are not negative? And I think there's a pretty good argument that those artificial intelligences are going to need caregiving too, and vice versa. If we want to have a relationship with these systems that's a positive relationship, it should be a relationship of care, not just a contractual relationship. And let me say last, because we heard about this a bit from the previous speaker, that although I think these ideas are quite different from what's happened in a lot of um, traditional Western European philosophy, I've argued that if you look at someone like Meng Shi and uh, many of the, of the Asian traditions, you see this kind of ethics of care. You see the idea that our politics, our society, really should be rooted in these close relationships of care within, say, a family, these close relationships of caregiving. Um, so I think that's really what we need. We think about the future that we're facing, which is a future that's even more unpredictable and variable, where the things that we knew in the past are not gonna apply in the future. What we need is to have more care, more protection, and, and to uh, allow our children to thrive and explore. And let me stop there. Dr. Gopnik, thank you so much for the interesting speech. Thank you. From California.